Uh, we're going to turn our attention for the next uh, little while towards design solutions. And as Terry's mentioned to you this morning, uh, my background is uh, I'm an architect. Uh, I'm one of the partners at BGW. Dan Cook, the founder that uh, Terry had talked to you about this morning, uh, Dan is my partner. And uh, I thought it might be helpful for you just to get a little bit of background on, on how we merged into uh, to a partnership of, of sorts. And so um, I think Terry mentioned that his, his school project that he put together that he did for $14 a square foot, he did 10 to 12 years ago. I think it was actually 17 years ago in 1995 uh, that he started that project. And Dan went out and camped out on that job site as the contractor and the architect for better part of a year while that project was being led, or while he was leading that project, and while his, uh, an old friend of mine, Brian Asherin, was, was taking care of all of the office issues so that he could maintain some semblance of an income while that was going on. And uh, Dan got that project built for an amazingly low price, land donated, all kinds of blessings along the way. Uh, men coming to Christ, he had actually uh, 10, 10 uh, subcontractors who were LDS sub subcontractors come to Christ on that job site. And in Utah, when you're an LDS person who commits their life to Christ, that's the kiss of death for your company. And he actually uh, uh, had these 10 individuals come to Christ among others on the job. Uh, but my introduction to Dan was about a year later, Dan had finished that project and, and tried to get back into his practice. And he was so depressed going back into conventional secular work that he decided he'd uh, try and do something different. And he, he really felt, I think, a calling, if, if he would describe that to you, a calling to go out and see Christian education succeed around the nation. And so Dan uh, decided to turn uh, his practice for a little bit longer over to Brian. A few months later, he called Brian into the office and said, do you know any other architects in the state of Utah that I can pass this off to? And Brian knew me. I didn't know Dan. I'd never met him before. And Brian and Dan showed up on my doorstep 30 miles south in Salt Lake City. I ran an office down in Salt Lake City and, and Dan walked in the door and he said, I, I'd like to give you all of my clients. And I said, well, come on in, let's talk. And so uh, this was the easiest marketing I'd ever done. And uh, Dan passed along one client in particular, uh, a group called Mountain America Credit Union Organization. I've done 300,000 square feet of their corporate center. I've done uh, 70 of their buildings and so forth. But for some period of time after Dan came in and introduced himself to, to me to tell me what he was doing, uh, he left. I thought he was being silly. I thought, boy, you know, nobody's going to ever make a living doing Christian schools. I had finished doing a school for my own church in Salt Lake City, the EV Free Church there. And I thought he'll be back in six months looking for these clients again because he'll never make a living. And off he went. Uh, I'd never heard anything about building God's way, had not heard that term. Uh, and all I knew is that he, was, he felt a passion about this and off he was going to, to go, go do this. About three years later, uh, I, I uh, read an article in a newspaper about a church in our downtown area of Salt Lake City that was, uh, just had finished construction. And I, I was a little bit confused because uh, the church was talking about working with an organization called Building God's Way. I was familiar with the church. I was familiar with the project because I had competed to try to get the project and an old class mine had, a classmate of mine had gotten the project uh, five years prior to that and had designed the building. And I had actually had lunch in his office and seen the model, uh, knew that the project was slightly over budget. They had a $4 million budget. The, the project priced out at $7.5 million uh, and that they were out there trying to search for money. And I was a, it was a consistent story. You know, that, that is oftentimes what happens. Uh, and I practiced architecture in a very similar way, to be honest with you. I was what, what might be termed a portfolio-driven architect. That's the way we're trained in school. We're trained as the artist architects, and this process is really all about us. In fact, the, the phrase in college is, is that architecture would be a great field if it wasn't for the client. <laughs> well, clients are tough. And, and they still are, by the way. Church clients are really tough because they're, they're consisting of, of uh, uh, many different kinds of individuals from building committees, a lot of different perspectives and tight budgets. But, but that whole notion betrays uh, an attitude of that this really is all about me practicing my art under the, the uh, medium of architecture and that I need clients to do that and I certainly need their budgets to do that. And that's the way I was trained. I pursued uh, high profile projects. My background was in performing arts work. I did a lot of high end performing arts centers. 
uh, among other things, we, we did sports planning, we did airport work, and I was on the constant search for padding my portfolio with the great photographs of architecture that would get me the next job and the next job and the next job to complete my portfolio of, of the embodiment of my work because that's the way that I identified myself is through my work. And, and Dan uh, has since turned my mind on that, but at the time, that's where I was coming from. And so uh, I was reading this article, Pastor Franz Davis, a African-American pastor in the downtown Salt Lake City area, was describing the process and he was saying, you know, we designed the building, great building, we loved it, we loved it, we loved it, it was over budget, and the architect kept saying, we don't want to compromise the design, try harder on the fundraising end. You're not trying hard enough. Have you contacted this foundation? Have you contacted that foundation? And it was very difficult to make any progress in that area. And he said he finally gave up, and they found this company called Building God's Way out of Ogden, Utah. And that was the first time I had heard the name Building God's Way. And my first response to that was negative. I thought, Building God's Way? Who names their company Building God's Way? What kind of special dispensation do these people think they have? And so I'm reading down the article, and boom, there is Dan Cook's name. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is the fellow that was in my office three years ago. He's gone out and gone off the deep end, and he's decided he's got some kind of special deal from God. And so I, uh, I was angry about it, honestly. I brought the article into the office. I had 25 architects working for me at the time, and I asked around the office, does anybody know anything about Dan's efforts to go towards building God's way? Nobody knew anything about it. It was off everybody's radar screen. And so I let it go. I uh, ran into Dan sometime later, some, some years later, uh, in 2002. I was the incoming president for the State American Institute of Architects. I hosted a statewide conference for all the owners of architectural firms. Dan showed up to that conference. At the time, I didn't realize it. He was there headhunting me. And uh, I, I was organizing speakers that day. As a result of that, uh, Dan wanted to have lunch with me. I couldn't afford the time for lunch, nor did I want to have lunch with him because this, after all, was the guy that named his company Building God's Way. And I, didn't, I didn't, still didn't appreciate that. And so um, he pestered me throughout the afternoon, and I finally agreed out of politeness to come up to Ogden to see what was going on in Ogden. And uh, six weeks later, it took me a little time to clear my schedule, but six weeks later, I ended up going up to Ogden, walked into a building I suspected was, was uh, Dan, a couple of draftsmen, and a, uh, maybe a, a secretary in, in the office. And I walked into an office that had 50 people. I had 25. He had double my staff, but he had 10 times the work that I was doing. And he had a tiger by the tail, and he had a desperate situation needing people to get this work done. Uh, he had a very efficient methodology of how to get the work done. He had a very different whole perspective on the way that, that architects and contractors work together, which we'll describe as, as the morning goes on a little bit. But uh, I was quite shocked at the, uh, the arrangement that he was working under in, Ogden, of all places, Ogden, Utah. And so um, I spent, I really had planned on going up there that day to spend about 45 minutes. I ended up spending about six hours that day with Dan uh, hearing a little bit about things. He would leave me alone at times. I would wander around and talk to different individuals that fulfilled different roles in the company, very different than my office, set up in a very different kind of way. Uh, and what I was basically seeing was uh, architects who were practicing architecture and not practicing legal defense of their drawings. Uh, this was not a confrontational uh, method that I was certainly used to. This was more of a cooperative method. And uh, as Terry mentioned, he had a supply side. We had he had product uh, personnel in there who knew products and understood how to procure things in a very different kind of way that most architects do, finding superior values and so forth. And I was intrigued by it, but I was basically up there that day to steal some good ideas and get back to Salt Lake City. I was not up there to join Dan Cook at Building God's Way. And at the end of the day, he said, uh, would you consider uh, stopping what you're doing and coming to practice with me and bring your, your firm staff to, uh, to this company. You can stay in Salt Lake. I had an office building down there. You can stay down there. We'll just practice the way that we do now, uh, which is over phone lines and so forth. And I said, boy, Dan, no way. I said, I, I, I've got this practice. I've got this portfolio. I've got this. I've got that. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. I understand all that. And I said, you know, besides that, I don't really understand where in the world you came off naming your company Building God's Way. I don't get that. And he said, you know, I, I probably didn't say it as crassly as you, you think you've got some special gift from God here. Dan's a mediocre designer, by the way. He was really looking to me to design. He's a, 
he's a pretty good contractor, but I'm thinking, you know, he's a pretty straightforward designer and he doesn't, he doesn't ever win any awards. How good of an architect could he be? And, and I'm thinking to myself, well, uh, this is the guy that wants me to join him. And he said, I just can't, I can't understand how you could name your company Building God's Way. What, what kind of special de deal do you think you got go going on with God here? And he said, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with that. In fact, he laughed at me, I remember, and he smiled, or at least a broad smile, and he said, it has to do with two other things. He said, stewardship and ministry. And Terry told you the story this morning about his experience as a pre-Christian before he accepted Christ as a contractor or an architect being excluded from the conversation about who God was from the very people who knew God. And here he was telling me, we are going to minister to these men. These, these men are coming from broken families. There's lots of alcoholism. There's lots of drug abuse. This is a target market for us to go reach men and not, not practice architecture or construction, but to go reach men through these projects. That's our ministry side. And we do it through the churches and the schools that we work on. And on the stewardship side, that's just simple biblical principles. Too many of these projects are run up the pole and never get built. Uh, the churches will spend an enormous amount of money on architectural design, but never go any further with it. So I thought that was a pretty interesting answer. And uh, as a result of that, I ended up joining Dan as his partner. I brought my full staff into that. Immediately, some of my staff started looking for other jobs. Uh, they were not believers. They couldn't even imagine what was going on here in my mind. To be honest with you, I'm not sure how many of my staff even knew what I believed. Uh, I, I had my feet in two worlds, and I was making it very known to my staff and, and weirding them out a little bit about what it was that I believed. Uh, some of them got it, it, wanted it, stayed, stuck with it. Some of them left, and we replenished those staff with other individuals. And so since that time, we've never looked back. And for 10 years now, my role in the company has largely been in the design capacity, uh, out working with churches and schools all over the nation. I, in fact, I just finished a 95,000 square foot school down in, for Geneva School down in Orlando, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, caught a plane flight last night, <clears throat> almost missed the flight. So I feel lucky to be here, but uh, that's what I do for the majority of my time. This, this time to share with you is just to sort of get in a little bit to the philosophy of what it is that we do and some of the things that we've noticed over the 10 years that I've been doing this on a full-time plus basis, we have seen some, some unbelievable transitions. The building that we're in today, I didn't design this building, but we would never design a building exactly in this way anymore. There are things that have happened in the world of church design that would cause us to think differently about the way that we approach projects. And so this morning, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, and then we're going to talk in the next session about sustainability. So let's go ahead and start our, our session here on design solutions, and I'll see if I can figure this out. Three demons were trying to destroy Christianity, and the first demon, uh, in talking about their approach, decided the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to simply sell people on the fact that there is no heaven, that there is no heaven. And if we can convince people that there is no heaven, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to give up on God. And the second demon said, well, I'm going to take a look at the idea that there is no hell. And I'll describe that to, to individuals and, and uh, see what happens with that kind of a course of action. And the third demon, the one that seemed to have the most success in the whole endeavor here, said, well, I think what we're going to do is try and convince them that it just doesn't matter. And that's largely what's happened in American culture today, is that there's been a complacency that has crept in uh, largely guided by this evil influence, this secular influence that says it really doesn't matter what it is that you believe. And so that's the kind of thing that we've noticed as we've gone along. Does Christianity really matter? Is it really important to us? Um, there's been, as Terry has gotten into this morning, there's been cultural changes uh, that, have, that have been introduced into the American um, psyche over the last few years that are dramatic. We've noticed it in a lot of the churches that we do, a lot of the people that we talk to. Uh, certainly intergenerational differences have become pronounced. The whole notion of the way that millennials think versus the way that I as a baby boomer think is a dramatic shift. And that, that has become noticeable and it's become part of the conversation in church design today. In the last few years, uh, there has been a, a change in the way that people identify themselves with churches. It doesn't sound like a dramatic shift from 15 to 20 percent, 
Believe me, that is a dramatic shift, and we are seeing the evidence of that all over the United States today. The rural churches sometimes will tell us, boy, we're not really seeing that. You will. You will. It has is, it is crept out from the urban areas, and it has gone forward. And it's largely, I think, been a, a matter of uh, some kind of an influence from the media, perhaps, whatever, it, where, whatever the source is. There is no denying the fact that people have become largely Europeanized in terms of church. If you've been to, to, to uh, Europe before, I was talking to the person who was, who was working out. Terry and I ended up at the rental car company last night together, uh, from coming from two different places, and we were standing there talking to her about what it is that we do and why we were here. And she said, oh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been to, to some great churches before too. And she was ta talking about her trip to Florence, Italy, a trip that I had the a pleasure of taking it about 10 years ago. I went to Florence, Italy and saw some of the great churches that I had studied when I was in architectural school. Beautiful, stunning, beautiful churches, completely dead. No people. They've become tourist artifacts. And that's where we're headed these days, is that our churches are becoming tourist artifacts if they're of, of any quality or beauty. And the, the life of the church, the life and the connection to Christ is largely petering out in many, many congregations today. So what do we do about it? Well, from our perspective, uh, we, we really believe that, um, that, that some, and to some extent, that design matters. We understand that there's something going on in the psyche of the United States right now, some things that we can't solve, but we, all, we also understand that there are some things this whole notion of irrelevancy that has crept in, particularly to the younger generation's mindset towards the church, needs to be addressed. And so what we've decided as a group is that there are things that we can do to attack that, to become offensively minded. We believe that the answer is to become offensive as opposed to staying defensive. We come to these conferences, we lead these seminars, and the churches are filled with, uh, or the, the seminars are filled with churches who come and they are trying to learn how to, to leave the identity of a defensive mind church to an offensive mind church. We end up talking not so much about design, but we end up talking a lot about the kinds of things that, that uh, embody the, the current thought or the cultural change inside a congregation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the things that identify us as an offensive church versus a defensive church. An offensive church says to themselves, we're going to either grow or die. Growth is imperative. In a defensive-minded church, uh, growth is considered dangerous. Growth is not a good thing because it represents change. In an offensive-minded church, there's an external focus outside the church. Obviously, some care for the inside of the church but they are externally focused in turning the minds and hearts of the people in the church towards the outside of the church. Whereas a church playing defense is oftentimes more concerned about how do we, how do we care for the people on in the inside? How do we gather the, the people and protect the people that are on the inside of the church? What, what we would call a country club church is a church that's there for the cl club members, but not necessarily there to expand the club. So what we, what we are oftentimes doing is challenging churches to change their position on whether or not they're just simply trying to come up with facilities that honor and glorify and create monuments to themselves or to a pastor or to an architect. And instead, think of the facility as a tool for a different kind of reach, an external reach that at the same time emboldens and fosters growth in the internal part of the church. And so that's, that's the sort of thing that we can do. And you can look through the rest of the, uh, the descriptors here uh, obviously, there's some empowerment of, of the people within the church as a church begins to mature and grow. Uh, if you ever want a good example of that, get, get on the uh, web and look at the Mars Hill Church at uh, Mark Driscoll, the pastor of, of the Mars Hill Church, and the way that they have really tried to figure out how to plug younger males into their church, how they've decided they've got to, to, to become externally focused to a community largely defo devoid of God in the, north, in the Seattle area, uh, by using the, the ability to plug young male men into their church and becoming offensively minded. Growing churches today are becoming dangerous churches. And by danger, I don't know if you've heard the title of the book, The Dangerous Church. Uh, the, the, the dangerous church is, uh, is a church that Satan is very, very afraid of. 
And so what we're looking for is a, a church that's missional or invitational, that's relevant. That word relevant is very, very important to this younger generation, is, is coming up with a church that is authentic, that has community, and that is connected to, that, to the external community. We see this happening in four areas, four primary areas. I'm going to take a minute and see if I can lift this up just a little bit. I need to grow longer arms. Four, four key areas that we've, we've noticed some, some uh, shifts in. Just in the short time that I've been designing churches, you know the secret to that, Tobias? Okay, good. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. It's my eyes, I can't see. <laughs> so four, four key areas that uh, I think are very important for us to be focusing on that we've noticed some shifts in a very recent period of time. The whole notion of third place. I don't know if you all have heard the term third place before in current conversation. It applies to a lot of different things and it was largely born out of the area of retail design. Uh, Starbucks, Panera Bread have created excellent examples. Barnes and Noble, places where people like to go hang out. I sat at a Starbucks this morning. I've become hooked on their blueberry oatmeal, by the way. They have a great, great oatmeal serving in the morning. I stopped by Starbucks. I had about an hour and a half to, to get some emails returned. I sat down and I'll bet uh, 200 people came in over that period of time. I was facing the door, I could see the line. Half of those people came in greeting the person who was gonna serve them the coffee by name. That was where they go to find community. These, these establishments have, decide, have figured out and established places where people go to find community. Well, churches have figured out, figured out the same thing. We need to make our church a place where people will consider this to be in, integral to where they find community. Our first place is our home. Our second place is where we go to work. Our third place is where we go to find, find community. Every Saturday morning, I look forward, even though I spend a lot of time on the road, I look forward to being home on Friday night and getting to the coffee garden, which is where I go to have coffee with four friends. We sit and connect with one another. We hold each other accountable. We find out what's going on in each other's lives. The coffee garden is where I go to find community. I've been doing it for 17 years, every Saturday morning at seven o'clock. Well, churches can become that third place. And so the old days of the small narthex outside the large worship area, the narthex served the purpose of coming in, shaking off the rain or the snow or whatever it was, hanging up your coat, grabbing your bulletin, and boom, you're in. And then when you're done, you finish up and you're out. But you were committed to that church largely because that was the institution that you had committed your life to. This generation's not joining institutions of any sort. It's not just churches, it's all kinds of institutions that are in trouble. They're not going f because that's what we do. They're not joining institutions in that regard. They're joining places where they go to find community. And so we need to create space where community is fostered, where the seeds of discipleship can happen. And so that third place becomes critical. That, that is a place where, where people are going to gather before and after, maybe all through the week. And we need to, need to design these places so that they are multi-use. It, it's a terrible uh, misuse of the whole principle of stewardship if we create a space that's really active for 45 minutes before and after a, a church service, but sits empty the rest of the week. So we've got to think creatively about how do we make space inside that's adjacent to our worship areas that's legitimate community space that can be used all through the week for different reasons. If, if the gals want to come and have a breakfast there on Wednesday morning or the men want to come and on Thursday evenings and gather together, it's a place where they can come and feel like they are in their family room, in their home. That's where they're going to be together. And they feel comfortable with that. This particular uh, slide that you see right here is, is a church that we just finished up down in Downey uh, they're in the process of changing sites, but they need to solve this problem now. People come to church, they actually meet in three different locations on this small campus, and then afterwards they scatter, they're gone, because there is no community space. So this is outdoor community space, it happens to be uh, down in Downey, California, which is, uh, or La Habra, excuse me, La Habra, California, which is one of the most ideal climates in the United States, they can actually put some shade out there and have a wonderful place to meet 50 weeks out of the 52. The other two weeks, maybe there's a, there's a little rainstorm going on, but this is one of those places where you can actually accomplish it. Most churches don't have the climate to allow that to happen in an outdoor situation. 
but this church does. So just creating those kinds of spaces. Spaces that, that allow us to serve coffee. Uh, coffee is one of those things that's just simply like, like food. It's a great medium for us to be able to gather around and to break bread or to, to have coffee with one another to be able to do that. This is a, uh, a good example. This is a church that we're just finishing the design work on and getting ready to take to the next level in Salt Lake City called the Rock Church. Uh, this church, you can see the, the church is designed, and you'll see an illustration of this in just a few minutes, but it's designed like a community center. Uh, before I got involved in strictly church design and school design, uh, we did a lot of, of large public community centers. My partner had been with HOK Sports out of Kansas City. He's actually from Kansas City, or my, my previous partner. And uh, Craig had come out to Utah largely to do community centers. We did a, a number of large community centers. If you walk into a good uh, civic community center, they're very different than the old YMCA's. You used to go into the YMCA and there'd be a little guy sitting there taking names down the front and take your two and a half bucks or whatever it was to get in there. Had his little clicker, you know, he'd click you in and, and you'd go down the hall and to the left and up the stairs and through the grandmother's house to the woods or whatever it was. You, you'd get there, but it was a circuitous route. You didn't see anything in the front lobby space. That's the way the old Y's were, were designed. These new civic centers or new community centers, you walk in and what do you see? You see it all. You see everything. That's where the, the pool is. And there's a big glass wall with the kids goofing around in the pool. There's the weight room with all the guys flexing their muscles in the big glass window into the weight room. There's the, the jogging track right through the middle of the space, just slicing through and then off to some unknown area for the rest of the track. Basketball courts, climbing walls, concession stands, whatever it is, it's all right there. And that's the way this church is designed in the same way in that there's a hub created to the church that allows that to be a, become a central space around which all the ministries of the church can be attracted and brought into. You can see this kind of a space is relatively simple, open structure space, maybe a few clouds hanging down, maybe some natural light in the space, but it's a space that's accessible to everything. Everything is apparent. We can see all the ministries of the church. It's all right there. Now, it's different. We're not going in there and seeing climbing walls, although I actually did a climbing wall in a church one time, but we may have a playground in that space. We may have access to the administration space. We may have certainly access to the worship area, access to the restrooms, a place to go get a cup of coffee, a point of entry for our kids, a secure point of entry for our kids. All those things are right there. So, so designing that kind of space is critical. You can see different examples of this as we go through this. Here's a good example, uh, James Sparks, Throw your hand up, James. James is with Story Construction. The story is, uh, James has come down from, uh, from uh, Ames, Iowa. A story built this building for us. This is the uh, Cornerstone Church up in Ames. Uh, this is their, their coffee bar. Uh, it, it's not a huge profit center for them. It's a, simply a place that allows them to serve and to allow people to, to hang before and after the church service and to connect with one another to form those bonds of community. You can see very simple type space. This is a small coffee bar in the context. This is a 3,000 member church uh, grown from 1,800 to 3,000 in the four years that this building has built, been built. But this little coffee bar is to the side of a 6,000 square foot lobby space. This lobby space is used for all different kinds of events. They'll have art shows a couple of times a year. And the art shows aren't for the people in the church to come ex exhibit their art to one another. It's a place where they can involve the community. This is a place where we can bring people in from the outside who maybe have never stepped foot in a church before, but they're invited there because they are hearing that art is important. And so they come in, their space is actually turned into an exhibition area for several weeks, a couple of times a year. And so they're, they're meeting the community in their third place and they're incorporating community in their third place. That's the kind of mindset shift that we're, we're needing to do, and we're, we're needing space to provide that. Uh, this is interesting. Mike Despard uh, with the church, one of the associate pastors with the church, is actually trained in architecture, and, and he and I got into the discussion about these colors, this lime green color, which is really lime green on that screen. It's not so much in real life, but, but the lime green color and the pumpkin color, and, and, and Mike said, these colors are very relevant today, but in five years, these colors are going to be out of favor, and we're going to do something different. We need something that can allow us to change in this space, something simple like paint. 
paint folks is free. I mean, they're not giving it away, but it's darn near free in the context of everything else. You go down and you buy you know, a gallon of paint for 20 bucks or whatever it is these days, and a few gallons of paint later, you have changed the relevancy of the space. And so their choice is to use what's called the free tools of architecture, color, to do something simple in a space to make it relevant. That lime green and that pumpkin color, about gone. In a few years from now, we're going to be thinking about something different. I've heard the color this year is uh, kind of a seafoam green. That's what we're supposed to be wearing now. So I've got to go buy a seafoam green shirt, I guess, or something like that. That, that's, the, that's the color that's been decided that the American culture is going to be into from now on. I, I'm not one of the, the guys that sits in New York thinking up these colors, but I can tell you there are people that do that. I actually walked into a meeting at Steelcase one time where there were five people sitting around saying, what's the color palette that's going to be next year's color palette that we're going to go with? And they were, they were responding to a group from New York who had sent them next year's colors. That's the way our American culture works. We need to figure out how to stay relevant. It's just like Terry's example this morning of the icebox. Of course, we don't call it an icebox anymore. We've changed the name of it, but it still does the same thing. It keeps food cold. We're not changing the message of the gospel, but what difference does it make whether we use lime green, pumpkin, seafoam green, or whatever it is? Let's make the space relevant and usable and changeable. And so that's the kind of things that we're, we're constantly talking about. Just, you can see good examples of just the way that, that uh, space is, is kept current. Um, we, we have partnered with a group out of uh, Spokane, Dominion Trading Company, who uh, is deriving their coffee from Ethiopia. E this this, this uh, group, Dominion Trading, is a full-service uh, coffee trading company uh, that brings a, a, certainly a high-quality co coffee. I was down in California recently and talking to this coffee Connoisseur, I didn't know that they existed, but he actually had a degree in coffee of some sort. And uh, he, I said, well, what is the best coffee in the United States? I mean, in the world today. And he said, oh, without a doubt, Ethiopian coffee is the best coffee. Well, this company has worked with, with groups out of Ethiopia, but they're missional-minded. This is a group that's using the, the profits of their company in order to uh, expand their ministries in this area to bring the gospel to the uh, Ethiopian culture. And so the, this is a... a coffee with a cause, so to speak, and we would encourage you. We don't have a, uh, a formal relationship with this group. We don't have any kind of ties to them. We're simply looking for a good, solid, representational group that brings ministry into this whole aspect of things. So they're a good example of what you can do to, to incorporate ministry and, and do something that's supporting a way to be missionally minded in other parts of the United States. What they'll tell you, too, when you get involved in these things is that, I mean, they'll take it not just to supplying the coffee, but actually setting up your whole coffee service area. And they'll tell you that if you try to design the, the coffee area the way that a Starbucks does or the way that a Seattle coffee company or something like that does, you'd be making a huge mistake because those organizations are meant to serve coffee cup at a time, cup at a time, cup at a time as people trickle in the store and trickle back out of the store. Churches serve coffee and serve the, the uh the group that they have in a very different way. Suddenly there's 400 people on them. And so you've got to prepare coffee in a different way and they're set up to do those kinds of things. So you have to, you have to think strategically about the way it actually goes together. Whole different set of equipment, whole different approach. Don't make the mistake of going out and getting sold something that is latest and greatest in Starbucks that's not going to serve your purposes. There's better ways to do that. So I would encourage you to be in contact with them. The second area that we really focus on is the whole area that we, we started out talking this morning briefly about is the whole notion of technology. Uh, this is a, a generation of individuals, this millennial generation, those born between 1980 and about the year 2000, that have a high expectation that you're going to be incorporating technology into their, into their services. You know, there, there's going to be a lot of times where they're going to be sitting there in the service uh, working on their devices. And if, you, if you make the mistake as a pastor going in and saying, can everybody please turn your phones off, uh, as we start our service today, you are just telling those, those millennials, you might as well just leave. because They're not going to do that. That's not, that's not the deal. That, that is an extension. That's like their third arm, right? That's a very important... It's like my third arm, much less the millennials' third arm. You know, I was sitting in the back of the room. I've checked emails a half a dozen times this morning. I've gone through uh, text messaging to people that I needed to get information to. I've set up phone calls for later in the afternoon. Those kinds of things are important, and they, this is a multitasking generation. It's also, technology is also a high expectation of men. One of, the, one of the themes this morning is designing for men. We're going to talk about that in just a few.